I have a little video that kind of contextualizes the work that I do. Um, so broadly speaking, yes, I am a Create for Change ambassador. And the initiative, in, in a very broad sense, is to how do you engage and motivate young content creators who are on YouTube? How do you get them motivated to tackle some of these issues? And me, with alongside, I think, another 51 creators from around the world who um, are coming together to um, engage with some of these issues. But yeah, this video contextualizes my channel, which is called Benny. I'm Nadir, a content creator and producer. A couple of hours until the deadline. You know how many hours you have to the deadline? How many? No. <laughs> I'm interested in alternative culture and pursuing an answer to a question that I've always had. Who am I? As a mixed ethnic boy, I've, I've, I've never felt like I fully belong anywhere. <laughs> Someone's touching me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to discover how other young people like myself are negotiating their identity where their cultural and spiritual traditions clash with a young generation's attitudes towards lifestyle. I travel and seek to discover a new global youth culture that is emerging, in hopes I can find a place I belong. Yeah, it's an exploration of self. I talk about issues of identity and, and representation. Um, I started about 16, 17 months ago, and it's been a crazy whirlwind up until then. You know, the thing that's really great about talking with you and about um, this video is is um, this question of where I'm from, where are we from, is so kind of pervasive and deep for so many different kinds of people, and it certainly resonates with me as uh, as somebody who you know I'm I'm from the U.S. My my parents are technically, you know, um, at least for the last few generations from the American South, from Georgia. They, um, they come from people who were brought here involuntarily um, as enslaved people. We think from Nigeria and Mali, thanks to Ancestry.com, um, <laughs> you know. Um, um, but, but my dad, you know, during the Vietnam War, he joined the military, and we ended up becoming a family that moved every few years all, all over the world. And so my sense of where I'm from is like all over the map. I am from my parents. That is, that is what I know clearly. Um, but in terms of, you know, I have a little bit of s the, the legacy of the South in me. Um, I, I technically am an American citizen. That is where I've lived the most of my adult life. But I grew up with America being an idea in my, in my head um, because I lived outside of the country for so much of my childhood on military bases. So I had a very, um, yeah, you know, a fantastic kind of impression of what America was, very much like a lot of other people who ultimately migrate to the US. Um, I, I knew it through you know, shows, television shows, and, and films and that sort of thing. Um, and that kind of identity, I think, has very much I, um, defined me over the course of my work. I'm an artist, um, an artist who was raised by activists and, um, and uh, have been investigating what that means, what the sort of bringing together of art, in my case, pop culture, art, and um, social justice means, what, what is possible when those two worlds come together. And I'm now, um, I have the great privilege of, of leading a, an ambitious, a really ambitious new effort, the Pop Culture Collaborative, which is um, a philanthropic fund and learning community focused on transforming the narratives, the stories we tell about people of color, migrants, refugees, Muslims, indigenous people, um, especially those who are women and trans, gender, and queer, and um, disabled. And we have come to understand early on in the life of the collaborative, which is less than two years old <laughs> at this point, that um, transforming narratives isn't, isn't only about transforming the representation, right? It's not just about what the stories are about or even who, um, who is telling those stories. It's also about um, creating a very different industry out of which those stories emerge, mm. an industry that is, um, it is, is far more just and democratic and safe. Mm. Right, in all of the ways that people feel insecure inside of their workplaces, 
how do we actually transform them so that people feel free to create from their most authentic voice. But what is the context behind that motivation? Do you feel like the current climate in which artists and creatives have to operate now in is unjust or it's discriminatory, it's difficult? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think what we're seeing is whether you're talking about, you know, uh, theater and um, other kinds of, of performing arts or cultural arts or mass arts like television and, and the digital space and film and, and that sort of thing, what, we, what is real is that the industries have on some levels been structured to um, clear the path for certain types of people mm. and obstruct the path of others, mm. right? So, um, for instance, we're doing a lot of our early investments in the television industry in the U.S., and it's very clear from all of the research, from the anecdotal stories that you hear from particularly artists of color in television, um, writers and producers specifically, that um, if you are... Uh, a white man, particularly of older, slightly older age, there is just an incredible landscape of opportunity available. Mm. And there is kind of a wind at your back as you move through your career. Yeah. Uh, the pipelines are created to respond to the cultural reality and knowledge and competency that that community has. 100%. Right? So if yeah. you aren't yeah. a white male of a certain age, then you're actually hitting barriers mm -hmm. every step of the way throughout your journey. Um, hopefully you have a long life yeah. and career, but that's still rare yeah. for artists of color. So we have to figure out how to not, not fix what, you know, yeah. fix those barriers, but to reimagine those spaces yeah. altogether. I mean, those are sentiments I can totally kind of vibe with. I think like thinking about my whole, and what, what, the reason why YouTube was such a liberating platform for me was that actually these structures, which had been barriers my whole life, actually totally like demotivated me from getting yeah. involved in the creative space from a young age. Yeah. So why I can vibe with you particularly is because I did love acting when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Acting was a big part of my life. A lot of my friends went to drama school. But the reason I didn't follow through was because I felt like the space would not welcome or encompass who I was in my entirety. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like erred from it and I shifted. I went into academia because I thought it was safer. But YouTube represented a space in which I could represent myself without the system dictating what that meant. YouTube was an incredibly like, dem this isn't a plug by the way, no one from YouTube is actually here, <laughs> so I can be honest. But YouTube represented a completely democratic space for me. In essence, I could come up with an idea right now, I could upload it in an hour, yeah. and if it vibed emotionally with people, people around the world would see it. And that's how I started. I had a, I, I, I had a video in which I made a parody of Pharrell's Happy Song. And um, I had no video experience, I, it was the first time I'd ever made a video in my life. I got some friends together and literally uploaded it expecting like a thousand views. If I was lucky, friends and family, because my family is probably a thousand people know, knowing them. <laughs> but then after the course of like 24 hours, it had 1.7 million views. I was, getting, I was getting phone calls, interview requests, I was getting TV requests. And it just showed me that a democratic space like YouTube mm -hmm. can mobilize global sentiment for people who feel just, just as disenfranchised as I might be. Mm -hmm. But in your experience, how can creators and artists and people in this sphere, how can they liberate themselves from this structure that you're talking about? How does a fun like pop? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think actually your example is a perfect, um, it, it is a perfect sort of story of how one can take hold of, of infrastructure, of equipment, of, of resources, and, and reclaim them and, and, uh, and use them to put your own voice mm -hmm. out there. And I think one of the questions that we have to sort of think about is how do we allow for that phenomenon to happen in a lot of other spaces in the sort of cultural realm, particularly in the pop culture realm where the costs often are prohibitive. They, they prevent a lot of artists from accessing yeah. them, not only the, the, the space to develop, but to produce and ultimately certainly to distribute their work. Mm -hmm. But I think um, there are some clues about that. So, um, you know, one of our early grantees at the Collaborative, and, and we fund everybody, we fund people in the social justice world, we fund artists in the entertainment world, artists in all other fields as well, um, who are thinking about how to reach mass audiences. And one of our early grantees was Issa Rae, 
who would absolutely point to YouTube as being um, the space that gave her the outlet to, to tell the story she wanted to tell. So, you know, the thing that has always resonated with me when I've talked with her, we both went to Stanford, we both had the same experience as creative people um, in college, which was that, like, you know, if you're a little kind of left of whatever the center cultural identity is, particularly um, in the African American community, like, where do you fit? Like, where do you fit in her case if you're kind of awkward, if you're, you know, um, uh, and so she 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 took hold of the new YouTube opportunities to tell the story about a really awkward black girl who was hilarious, who had you know uh, a great group of equally awkward friends, and um, and it took off because well surprise there were thousands and thousands of other people who who completely resonated with this kind of like kind of black nerd, black awkward culture mm. and, 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 and character. And, um, and, and so YouTube became that space where she could freely tell her story. It was economical. She, you know, she had a, her writer's room in a very small space um, in, in Los Angeles where all of these writers of color came together to create that yeah. content. And then it was out in the world. But I think it's really rare, what's really amazing to hear about the whole Issa Rae story is that it's really rare to hear funders especially have faith in a new medium like YouTube because yeah. it's still very misunderstood and the dynamics of being a creator in a social media space is kind of dubious. Right. But what were the key elements in that relationship with you guys and Issa Rae? Like what were the facets in that relationship that made it work from a donor perspective to a, mm -hmm. to a creator? So here's the thing, you know, we are, we are, the collaborative sort of like came along after Issa Rae's show. We did not have anything to do with funding her show. The work that I think is kind of the, the, the clue to the future that I think her work represents now is that she's created, in addition to her production company, she's created a company called Color Creative which is not about her work at all. It's about creating space for content creators, mostly in the digital realm, to develop pilots and move their work into the world mm. using some of the insights that she's gained, but also creating a whole other ecosystem and pipeline for those creators. So what we're funding her to do, her and her partner, uh, her creative partner, Denise Davis, to do is to create a, an environment, an incubator space, a pipeline solution for content creators of color who are working on YouTube um, to get their work out into the world uh, on their own terms, um, to not sell it, right? To, to own their own material, to license it to people who want to distribute it to different audiences, but to really be able to tell whole, rich, dimensional stories um, by their own standards. Mm, would you say that owning the structure or the kind of being at the top <coughs> of the pyramid it, in terms of her color creative, do you think the reason why it's so significant is that she's able to build narratives on her, her and her community of people are able to build the stories on their uh, playground, on their kind yeah. of, their, their authority? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, we have a longer road ahead of us yeah. to change some of the things about the sort of like, you know, the large broadcast or cable network industry, right, that is set up for the distribution of episodic content, right? That is, we, there are years to go before that space is going to be completely ready for the really rich and powerful storytelling from communities of color, right, and, and communities, other communities that have been excluded from the pop culture story. Um, so while that work is also happening, we, um, we have this great uh, place in the digital realm, in spaces like YouTube, to, uh, to pilot and test an entirely different framework for how cre content is made and how it makes its way out into the world. Yeah. And, um, and that space is one in which more and more we are hearing from content creators that they want to own their stories. They want to be able to have an idea, build that idea into a script, into production, and know that the story that they intended to, t to tell is the story that audiences yeah. actually ultimately engage with. But just how many, like, 
how many cases are there like Issa Rae? How many Issa Rae's are there in the landscape? Because it sounds like quite, she's quite an exceptional person. Absolutely. So I wonder whether the space is there, do you feel like there is a pool of talent for funders to like pitch in or, or to invest in to have similar outcomes as you might have had with these? Well, I mean, I would actually sort of turn that back to you. Do you think that there's a pool of talent in all <laughs> yeah, the Yeah, really, really, I could think <laughs> no, of someone I mean, in like, particular. All the travels that you've done, <laughs> and all the people that you're meeting. Yeah. What do you think the talent pool looks like? Well, I, I think I have a love-hate relationship with this pool in itself because at one level I do feel like it is up and coming. Yeah. But one level I have to wholly accept that actually the pool is very small. The pool is small because we mentioned earlier that a lot of people from POC backgrounds had never been encouraged or motivated to get involved in this space. So mm -hmm. we were talking before about this dynamic of getting your children to be doctors or lawyers or all those safe uh, jobs, but there was a wisdom in that, and the wisdom was priority back in the day, especially for people with lower income households, was stability. So I don't resent that strive, yeah. but I think as the kind of generations become more affluent and different conversations are happening, what we're realizing as a generation of young people is to be able to express this really complicated identity I have, which is navigating multiple worlds at the same time, it does take creativity. Mm -hmm. A pragmatic mind that's very linear or very mathematical cannot fathom mm -hmm. the calamitous relationship I have with my identity. My parents are both mixed race, born and raised in London. How do I negotiate these multiple things if I'm not creative about it? Mm -hmm. So what this creative avenue has provided me is, is the experimentation, the platform to start thinking about my identity in very new and unique ways. Um, I'm not a video maker, I'm not a filmmaker, but I just see video as a tool, a yeah. tool to express something that's very important to me. Um, the key is, and what's very amazing to see is the conversations that are happening now whether the pool's as big as I'd like it to be, maybe not, but I do think it's there and it's increasingly growing at a really fast rate. But what's amazing to see is like, you know, the funders and the donors and the brands who are increasingly progressive and in how they are approaching creative people and starting to realize that yes, look, there are people and we need to put the money behind these people to support them and their ideas. And I think Issa mm -hmm. Rae is a perfect example of mm -hmm. that happening. Yeah, I also think that we have to broaden our understanding of, of where the pool lives, right? So we think, for instance, in, in television and film that like we're looking for filmmakers or television writers and we need to hire more of them into you know, spaces where they can make content. Or, um, but actually what we're finding is that, um, you know, particularly in the case of artists of color, where we live um, is in spaces that may not look like pop culture spaces, right? So a lot of really brilliant writers who should be writing for television are writing in theater. Mm. They're, you know, they're uh, being supported and nurtured by largely, um, you know, people of color led mm. theater companies in different communities across the country. Mm. Um, so we have to figure out how to better support writers in those spaces to write in um, mm -hmm. for other spaces, right? So I think that writers want to be moving very constantly back and forth between theater and television and perhaps film as well. Um, so how do we create the infrastructure that allows them to more easily do that? How do we take our mindset out of New York and LA, in our case, or London, um, in this case, of being like the centers of where kind of pop culture content gets made. Like, why can't we have a writer's room in Detroit or in Chicago or in Austin? Why do we need for those rooms to be located, you know, feeding into television series content in, in these mm -hmm. kind of centers? And when we begin to think more broadly that way, mm -hmm. then, then we start to see that the pool of talent mm -hmm. becomes much wider and wider. We also funded um, uh, a project called Secret Universes, which is um, it's a, a proprietary methodology for developing superhero characters mm -hmm. with, um, within communities, largely migrant communities. Um, and so they spend a day, um, the facilitators spend a day working to imagine kind of a superhero league with community members. And we funded them to think about what it looks like to build the pipeline from a community workshop to 
a franchise deal with a major studio, film studio. Like, well, why can't this intellectual property yeah. be viewed in the same way that we view whatever you know major producer is developing the next yeah. Marvel universe Probably. or whatever you know superhero? So, like, how do we actually create wow. yeah. community-based storytellers who have a pipeline to get their ideas? into major entertainment spaces. Yeah, I love that. We have to think, you know, Bigger, like wildly, sure. I'd say. Like, yeah, yeah, for sure, I love that. Right? I think why that really resonates with me is that I kind of feel like, you know, I, I, being involved in the space for a while now, I don't think there is a lack of, well, yeah, there is a lack of resources, but resources have been there. Mm -hmm. But at times you kind of feel frustrated because you feel like they're channeled in, in very short-term yeah. projects that don't follow through. And projects like that, there is a mm -hmm. clear follow-through ethos or theory, or, or mm -hmm. theory about it. And I kind of think the reason why that's so important for me is that um, when I think about my identity and conversations of myself, a lot of the kind of people in the space, um, the problem has become their identity. The resistance has become their identity. I kind of felt like growing up that like I was only given a stage to speak on or I was only given opportunities to get money if I was speaking about terrorism or speaking about the worst things or the tropes yeah. and stereotypes of my society. And I would go on and I would give a two minute talk or I would make a 10 minute video and there would be no follow through. There would be no actual transition into imagining those people in a better light. But what's great to hear about what you're saying is that it's the beginning or the periphery steps into building a culture or a future that imagine, uh, imagines ourselves as a community outside of that paradigm. Like for me, a lot of my work is about building a new subconscious, right? I don't want people to see me or, or, or another POC or someone from a Muslim descent and think about the tropes that negative mainstream media might build for them. And that's why I don't call what I do counter-narrative. I call it just building a completely entire new cognitive frame about those individuals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because if you start on a counter-narrative, your starting place is still that place. It's still bred from the poison, right? So I don't want to engage with that. So I try and build stories and human relationships that are completely detached from any pre-existing narrative that might be derogatory. Um, and that, for me, the future culture is following through. So if on a, even on a donor or on a funder level, they can pinpoint those people, those artists, that have a bit more of a future vision, then that's yeah. something I'd be much more kind of yeah. hopeful for in the future, because I feel like at least it's building to a future that I want my kids to grow in that is detached from the pain that, that mm -hmm. might be. Uh, that was really interesting. And um, as somebody who's working in dance of the African diaspora, it's particularly of interest to me uh, because <clears throat> most of the artists are obviously using the space, digital space, to create their work. Um, but what comes with that is intellectual property. Mm. And so I just wanted to find out how you deal with that mm. or your ideas of how to deal with it. Are you saying specifically you're concerned that the produce of your dances might be used by other people elsewhere? Okay. Yeah, that is definitely like a drawback of the digital space. Yeah. The problem is it's so voluminous. There's so much out there that it's hard to police. I think from my own stuff, what, what, the only way that I can be vigilant about it is um, branding it in a way that it's obviously part of my channel and what it is. Even if it means like certain watermarks in certain areas, then you can make certain claims in certain places. But it's, such, it's so important, and I'm glad you brought that up because people put their heart and soul into it. I don't think you can empathize unless you understand the process of being a creative and choreographing a dance and putting your heart and soul into it and then seeing someone else reap the benefits of what you could possibly be doing. But I've had a lot of personal conversations with YouTube about this, and a lot of the platforms like Facebook and Instagram have a problem, and they are addressing it, and they are doing their best to kind of pick up on this issue from the, from the onset and take down stuff that has been reposted by people who weren't the originators of that content. So these conversations are being had, but unfortunately, from a creative perspective, all I can do is create um, and hope that it isn't reproduced or put somewhere that it shouldn't be. And hopefully the platforms protect me in doing so. But those conversations are being had, for sure, and being pushed, definitely. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for your 
uh, discussion. It's been really interesting. I know that the Pop Culture Collaborative does a lot of work with pe social justice organizations. So we've talked a lot about the sort of industry of the arts. But is there, um, do you have thoughts about how social justice organizations that are working to address these things sort of wider outside of pop culture, how you work with them and what, what role they play in this? Yeah, um, so our, you know, I think that the pop culture collaborative is really rooted in culture change theory versus social change theory. Um, and the, the way that I see those two things being different is, um, or I should say social action theory. Um, in the past, we have seen culture, pop culture being used, um, for instance, to um, ignite movements in the traditional kind of behavior set. Um, social action, sign this, show up for a rally, donate here, right? Like that is the way that um, for many years when we brought pop culture and social change together, it was to get people to behave in those ways. Culture change sort of says, you know, we can use story and, and narrative immersion to inspire people to think and feel and behave in a, a much, much wider range of ways. We can, um, stories and immersion inside of story worlds can help people to think about themselves, their relationships with their parents, their families, their communities, people much different from them in different ways. It can inspire them to stand up in um, and, 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 you know, say absolutely not in the face of injustice. It can inspire them to, um, to step across their bounds of familiarity into new spaces and really form deep bonds with people, um, surprising bonds with people, right? Like, that is the power of story. And so with social justice organizations, we work primarily with those uh, organizations that are either deeply immersed in or entering the culture change space and beginning to understand on a more complex level the role that story immersion and narrative immersion plays in transforming the communities that they're trying to activate around immigration or police violence or the environment or, or any of these kind of big, hard issues. Um, and so we fund them to develop culture change strategies. We fund them to work with people in the entertainment world. Um, we have an entire, uh, one of our grantees is a network of culture change strategists working within social justice organizations who are the primary consultants to television showrunners around a whole range of issues. So they are helping entertainment storytellers to tell the most authentic and accountable stories about the issues that, that we all care about. So we really kind of have a, um, a broad view on the role that social justice organizations can play inside of a culture change process, but we do see them as a very integral partner working alongside storytellers to ultimately create a very different narrative environment in, in the US, um, but certainly in the UK and in other, other um, markets. <laughs>